Hi, this is Martha with webinar number three. I am going to review the slides that had the content from the webinars that used to be up rather than creating my own just to save time because there are people that are going to be testing very soon. So I'll go over the content using her slides and I think you'll get the idea about what is important for the exam. So we'll get started. On this webinar we're going to cover some of the more unusual complications that would occur during labor and delivery and fetal monitoring which will include a ruptured vasoprevia, fetal maternal hemorrhage, placental abruption, uterine rupture, scar dehiscence, second stage pushing, pushing medication and drugs, instrumentation, and then talk about artifact and arrhythmias and there were some questions on the test about that. There also was a few about drugs and their effects on fetal heart tones and also a little bit about adjunct fetal assessments, uh, biophysical profiles, NSTs, things like that. So I'm going to have to move side to side here to get to these. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is a what's also called a velamentous insertion of the umbilical cord, um, a, like a low insertion, um, also called a vasa previa, where the fetal vessels are inserted onto the amnion partially. They trail through the amnion and they're not completely connected directly to the, well they are connected to the placenta, but you get the picture. The, the vessels are in the amnion so when the water breaks you can get some some bleeding. All right, a little bit better description and a, a picture there. The fetal vessels traverse the membranes in front of fetal presenting part. That's not always the case. I've seen ones that after birth you see where they um, were up high enough that they were unaffected from when the membranes ruptured but oftentimes they are in front of the presenting part. It occurs in one out of 2,000 to 3,000 births and the risk of fetal exsanguination and death of the ruptured membrane is really high. Um, initially you get some fetal tachycardia as the baby tries to compensate and then bradycardia with the sinusoidal and then oftentimes you have fetal mortality with a 60% fetal mortality rate for that, very high. Even if you quickly rush back to C-section, sometimes um, you can uh, you end with an unsuccessful um, outcome. This is a case here where you can see what's a little bit of the progression of the strip. Um, patient comes in six centimeters plus one with spontaneous labor, contracting nicely. So far so good, doesn't look like too much going on. Then um, spontaneous rupture of membranes and bright red bleeding occurs and you see you have immediate um, deceleration there and then some difficulty picking up some heart tones. So they do their interventions, oxygen, left side, IV, flu fluid bolus and call the provider. They quickly make the decision to progress to C-section. Um, the RN puts um, an internal lead on a, a fetal spiral electrode and they go to the OR. Uh, outcome, they had, um, they were 15 minutes from the decision that something was wrong with this this rupture of membranes and, and bleeding to when they had the baby so that was a great time. Uh, APGARs were one and three it was um, there was a ruptured vasa previa so that had uh, involved the larger vessels and the baby was bleeding and the baby went to the NICU with a hemoglobin of 13.7 and hematocrit was 38 percent and got some transfusions.
there's a good picture you can kind of see as the person is lifting up underneath the amnion you can see those vessels kind of traversing the, the, the bag of water there what can also happen is um, some breaks or leaks small tears if there is an abdominal trauma sometime during the pregnancy a fall and and goes undetected that there's a bleed um, some some breaks or leaks occur at the at the placenta level and then there's some bleeding or blood mixing so with that if you suspect there is a hemorrhage and you get your patient in and they give a history of having some sort of trauma Keep in mind that if you have absent or decreased fetal movement, if they report absent or decreased fetal movement, um, you may find you have indeterminate or an abnormal fetal heart rate, or in the worst case scenario, you would have a sinusoidal rhythm. Here's the next slide, um, a case where there was some fet fetal maternal hemorrhage. Um, she's a G2P1 at 37 and 5. She had a um, low impact motor vehicle accident 55 minutes prior. Um, she was using her restraints and the airbag deployed. So she came to the hospital for observation. So I don't know what you notice first about this tracing. People could possibly look at that and, and see that little bit of undulation because it's not real completely textbook but they might think that that's just some variability there but I think it's trying to be more like a sinusoidal there with some little bit of spots there where it's just kind of flatter so then as the strip progresses as you're as you're watching here um, you can see that it definitely goes more to the textbook looking uh, sinusoidal there after a bit of time and then only really a few minutes go by this is another 10 minutes after that last strip and with what was going on in her history they took her um, to c-section and had a baby with APGARS 4 and 6 and it was needed some resuscitation and got some um, volume expanding. Initial hematocrit was 23. Some things that happen beside, you know, sometimes you don't have a complete abruptio placenta. You have somewhere in between a partial and you may have a, some concealed bleeding that is found afterwards. And some babies don't even show any signs of that. They, they must have enough reserve and it's a, a small amount of an abruption that they can uh, compensate. But by definition, abruptio placenta is a bleeding between the decidua and the placenta. So between where the, the fetal side, well, where the, the placenta attaches to uh, the uterus. So there's, there's some separation and some bleeding in between that. Here's some things to keep in mind if you're taking your patient's history. What are some of the risk factors for that? If your patient has a prior history of an abruption, that's something that you really want to take into consideration because the risk of occurrence is 5 to 15 percent um, which might not seem like very much at the time but if you think about that that's that's a big percentage if, if there was even a, a, a couple of percentage rate chance that it could happen again that's pretty high and if they've had two abruptions there's a 25 percent risk of reoccurrence for that um, if they're a smoker, there's a five-fold increased risk. Um, 
I'm sorry, if they have hypertension, it's a five-fold increased risk. And if they smoke, it's even more. And if they're preeclamptic, it's eight times risk, higher risk. Um, I mentioned cigarette smoking, um, cocaine use, or um, what had happened in that other case that we just looked at, um, if they've had a blunt abdominal trauma. Diagnosis is based on clinical findings. You'll notice increased uterine activity and fetal heart rate changes. So as far as fetal heart rate, decreased variability, variable or late decelerations, you might have sinusoidal or bradycardia. When they say you increase uterine activity, um, and I talked about chorio, uh, chorioamnionitis in the, in the last section. Um, Choreo and, and blood in that uterus is really irritating um, and causes a lot of uterine uh, contraction. So you'll notice that kind of that irritable, like undulating, continual contractions um, when that's happening. Um, KB is that, the, that test, the blood test at Clyhauer Becky, where you they look at a, a smear of the mom's blood to see if there's fetal cells in there. KB shows poor correlation and poor ultrasound sensitivity. And so I like to remind the patients that fall or have an abdominal trauma, they come in and they want to just be on the monitor for a little bit of time. And they say, I just want an ultrasound or I just want that blood test. Um, those just, um, you know, it's good information with uh, other things going on. Um, but even ultrasounds will miss um, a, good percentage of a small abruption. So the best, you know, course for them is to stay on the monitor for a while because your baby is going to tell you. The baby is going to tell you if there's something going on and if there's some trouble. So um, just time time and monitoring is, is the best thing that can happen. And management of that depends upon the severity and gestation also. All right. This is a, another case. I grabbed a three pair of two. She says 37 weeks. She complained of being hit in the abdomen. She's on the monitor um, for about five and a half hours. She's got increasing pain. Her variability is decreasing, more minimal, and then she has um, intermittent lates and she goes to a C section. And you can see on the bottom what I had described a little bit before about just that kind of what we used to call irritability where they have a lot of contractions close together, little bumpy contractions and um, because that uterus is real irritable and um, trying to kind of clamp down to prevent that bleed, you know, stop some of that bleeding. All right, another case, uh, G1P0, 38 and 1, arrived via ambulance complaining of stomach pain, and she admitted to smoking crack earlier in the day. So she's on the monitor just to make sure that fetal status is okay. You know, the beginning of the tracing, she's got, it's, it's kind of disconnected. You can't get a clear picture of what's going on, whether there's some variables or just maybe it almost looks like marked irritability or marked variability, but you can't get a good baseline. And then a little further into the tracing, it seems like it wants to try to be sinusoidal there, but she's got a fair amount of uterine activity there on the bottom. Okay. This is another one that um, a patient that was in labor and she's in second stage and pushing and she's had some um, moderate vaginal bleeding throughout the whole um, labor and now she's having some increased bleeding but she's got an epidural so she's pretty comfortable. She doesn't talk about pain because there, if patients that you have that really have an abruption or a real um, catastrophic abruption all at once have a lot of pain. They usually can't even stand it. Um, so in the past two hours, they charted moderate variability with intermittent variables. But now it seems 
to be progressing to what looks almost like a, a sinusoidal. She's pushing there, and they put the placenta or the placenta, the forceps on. And um, after delivery, they see that she had a 30% abruption. So this baby had some bleeding, but overall, it was he had probably some reserve left. And so the outcome was okay. That baby did well. One more to look at. Um, a G2P1 at 39 weeks, and she's here for an induction. She has a history of chronic hypertension and, pre, and also preeclampsia, and a history of prior abruption. So she is just a great candidate for this. She could, you may as well just get type and cross for some blood right away. Over the past three hours, fetal heart rate's been 150 with minimal variability in intermittent lates. And as she's she's um, having more increased contractions, they're placed in IUPC, and then all of a sudden the baby just kind of decompensates and has a prolonged deceleration. They go to C-section, and APGARs are 5 and 7 with a pH of 7.20, which, as you know, is, is not normal, but we get worse sometimes so um, they acted very appropriately and got the baby out and so the outcome was pretty good okay the next one to talk about is uterine rupture an unscarred uterus, someone that hasn't had a prior um, C-section or any kind of sort of myomectomy, something like that, um, has a 0.02% risk of rupture. If they've had one prior low transverse uterine C-section, um, they have a 0.5 to 0.9% um, risk after a trial of labor. Uh, 2010 vaginal birth after C-section is where this where these figures come from. So an unscarred uterus can can rupture also, um, especially if you have a multiple gestation. But um, the risk is higher if they've had a C-section, obviously. Intrapartum uterine rupture, you will see changes in fetal heart rate. That's the most common thing that you see. 70% of cases. You'll see lates, recurrent lates, variables, prolonged D cells, and fetal bradycardia. And that was one, that was few of the strips that we point out, pointed out that that was one of the first things that you think about, you know, abruption, something like that, and then maybe uterine rupture if you have a prolonged D cell or a persistent fetal bradycardia. Um, one of the other kind of hands-on sign that you see loss of fetal station so when when they say loss of fetal station you maybe go from having a, a head that's engaged to like if you broke a water balloon and all of a sudden that contents is out and everything kind of floats back up again so that baby's gonna float back up um, you have intense maternal pain but if they have an epidural they often won't feel it or they don't feel much um, vaginal bleeding but not necessarily because it could be a high rupture and it would go into the intra-abdominal area instead of coming out the vagina um, you would have increased uterine activity IUPC doesn't help assisting with this diagnosis um, increased uterine activity because the uterus is trying just to clamp down to stop some of that bleeding So this is um, a VBAC, or also a trial of labor after C-section. That's what TOLAC is. It's a Gravita 4 pair 3, and she came in in spontaneous labor, and now she's 5. And this is a new onset of her D-cells, and it's been 10 minutes now. And now you should start thinking about this. What kind of category strip is this? Um, You've got a little piece there, a baseline probably, maybe a couple more you could piece together. And it looks like it ranges 